Good morning, Thomas and Yera. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to each and every one of you to day one of the Plant Powered Show. I hope you're uh, ready. Are you hungry? Are you salivating? Some of you have driven from as far as Wooster to be here this wow. morning. We love that you've made the effort. Thank you. Thank you, Hershes. I look forward to being able to take some of the <laughs> soon-to-be second-hand appliances home with me later today. Hey? Uh, so uh, the Plant Powered Show, of course, aimed at every, everyone and anyone uh, with an interest in food, health, wellness, the environment, or more conscious living. And uh, apart from the exciting lineup of chefs who you've heard, who will entertain with live demos, this uh, three-day event of course, we'll also feature some diverse and compelling talks by leading health and wellness experts. And uh, without further ado, because there is a lot to get through and we're running way behind time, I'd like to firstly say thank you uh, to each and every one of you for making an effort. Jenny Morris, unfortunately, is unwell uh, and uh, sends her apologies. She really wishes she could be here. But uh, Alia Ferguson is with us and she's Lovely. She's <laughs> chatted to you already somewhat. She's qualified nutritional therapist and naturopath who loves her subject with a passion. Uh, through her own personal journey to achieve optimum health, she's able to help others begin their own journey on the same path. Uh, as a mother of two active boys, one of her key interests has been cultivating the most healthy habits in the next generation. Uh, her love for the planet, sustainability and social consciousness continues to fuel her desire to live in harmony with her environment and encourage <laughs> others to do the same. It's a very holistic approach. It's the essence of her uh, projects, workshops, articles and talks. And she is cooking up a storm for us today in this kitchen brought to you by McCain. Thank you. So I'm just oh. realizing, you know, that was quite a mouthful, but yes. also um, that's a, a piece of writing from my website. And I actually have a two and a half year old daughter now too. And that is what having a small child will do because I haven't updated that information on my website for it's about- a mother of three. Now. Yes, 17, 15, two and a half. Yes, we were very bored during COVID. We didn't really know what else to do with ourselves. So we just decided to have another child and we have a very cute little girl now. So um, yeah, but I have to say it does complicate things having two teenagers and a toddler. It's your split in many different directions. There's also a little bit more um, than just me, uh, not a little bit more, it sounds like it's nothing, but um, over the last six years, um, I have been running cooking and dining experiences in Cape Town. I'm half Persian. My father's Persian and my mother is Danish, uh, but my mother fell in love with all things Middle Eastern and Persian. So we grew up very much in a household with those influences. Although I have to say my mother's Scandinavian clean lines organization and minimalistic sort of approach, I feel that a lot in the way that I uh, approach Middle Eastern food. So, you know, sometimes if I think we can do it better by using less or, or not using some of the ingredients, then why not? Um, I, I get occasionally some uh, Persian granny with her knickers in a twist on YouTube telling me that we never did it that way. And I'm like, yes, but you didn't have a food processor in those days. I'm pretty sure you would have used it. Um, so yes, Jenny is uh, not here today. I'm actually doing a masterclass at two, um, but I offered to come and actually do some of Jenny's recipes with you guys. So you will be having Jenny's food, um, which looks amazing, by the way. I'm loving the look of this soup. We're going to do a beautiful broccoli soup. So I'm actually going to start also getting going with that. Um, and what's really nice is she's using coconut cream to give the soup a lot more body and like a silky mouth feel um, than obviously you would use normal cream. And actually you don't really, in, a, in something like a broccoli soup, you don't really uh, have to use um, anything like that. It's quite interesting when if you blend um, a, a, the broccoli with your stock and you don't over uh, cook it, you get a really beautiful, vibrant color um, and a very, very beautiful silky texture. So we're going to use some coconut, um, uh, coconut oil, which of course has solidified nicely because it's so cold. Um, and I think, yeah, this is an odorless coconut oil. Um, I think you could use the extra virgin here too if you wanted to because we're adding coconut cream. Um, but obviously, if you don't want that heavy um, coconut flavor permeating all your dishes, then, then it's wise to use uh, the odorless. Although it is, of course, it has been through quite a process 
So it is quite a processed uh, product. So I always believe, again, talking about the uh, nutrition side of things, it's always important to use things that have been, uh, been exposed to minimal processing. Um, the other thing that's very, uh, I think, interesting about the soup and the vegetable uh, curry we're doing today is we're going to be using frozen vegetables. Um, and I think for a long time now, certainly when I was growing up, there was a strong association. Well, I think actually we just thought peas and sweet corn were the only things you could buy frozen. And there was a strong association with frozen foods, especially vegetables being substandard. Right? I think that's definitely something we would have all thought. Um, and in many ways, sure, it's, it's much better to get, uh, you know, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. But actually, and I mean, if you look at the color of uh, the frozen broccoli here, you can see it's still got that very vibrant green color, you know? And I think these days with all the different, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Scientific processes that they use to freeze the blast freezing and the glazing and everything. It means there's a lot less water going into the vegetables. So it doesn't actually, you don't lose the integrity of the vegetables and you certainly don't lose the nutrition and I think that's a key thing really. Um, a lot of frozen berries, these kind of um, vegetables are frozen at source. Um, so that means they're going to maintain, you know, a lot of their nutritional integrity. So we're just going to fry some onion up. It's all been chopped so nicely by the fairies in the back. I want these fairies in my house. I try and get my teenage boys to help and I have to say they're pretty good on the whole but then their work is not as good as this. So we're adding some onion and we've got some of the, the usual suspects here like celery. Um, I, I don't think there's a single soup that I make where I would not add celery. And I think you all know what a sofrito is probably if you like to cook. It's onion, carrot and celery and it's the basis of most uh, sources in Italian cooking or really in, in any cooking I think these these days. And it's, it's a really interesting thing uh, adding the celery. You know you don't end up having a strong flavor of celery but it really adds something into uh, the body of the flavor. Um, I'm also a big fan actually of turnip. Um, I know it seems it's such a lost vegetable, you know, we really, I mean, how many of you go and buy turnips? Yeah, well, in, Mi in Middle Eastern cooking, there's a really, really fabulous recipe where you, it's better to use the smaller ones, the older ones can be a bit bitter, where you quarter them and you roast them with oil and salt and date syrup. And they caramelize on the outside as well. I just remember as a child, my father just sitting there eating them whole at the table. I used to be so embarrassed that he used to eat with his hands at the table. And I was at boarding school in England and these posh little girls would come home and sit with me with their Alice bands and my father would just be putting rice into his mouth with, it, with his hands, yeah. But of course these days, you know, we, we have such a different approach to uh, food. We're a, bit, a lot less stuffy, I think, which is, which is really wonderful. Um, I also remember, you know, not so long ago, so I'm 44 now. I shouldn't have really told you that, should I? But I guess if I have a 17-year-old son, then it probably makes sense. But I also remember um, when I was growing up, you really couldn't find dates, even avocados, basmati rice, you know, all of these things. You could not find them at all in conventional supermarkets. And I, we moved to South Africa when I was 15. I'm just adding some potato now, guys. And really, shopping for ingredients, any kind of exotic ingredients, was really, really challenging. Um, and I mean, we moved to a little dorp in Mpumalanga called White River. Do any of you know where White River is? It's right near the southernmost tip of the Kruger Park. And when we moved there, literally you couldn't even get a cup of coffee. Um, and there was one tiny little shop in Nelspreit, a wonderful lady called Juby, it was called Valley Spices. And you would go into her Aladdin's cave and you would buy um, the spices that you need or basmati rice and all of these kind of things. Um, and of course, these days you can get them at Woolworths uh, or Checkers or any of these places. So there's, uh, it's just wonderful to be able to have access to all of these ingredients. So I'm, I'm just uh, sweating down. In fact, let's turn the heat down just a fraction. I'm loving the color of this pot, so pretty. But they are so heavy, these Lacrosa pots, eh? You could definitely use them as self-defense weapons. Keep them in the cupboard near the uh, entrance door in the, in the back, you know, you can bash somebody on the, on the head with them. 
it's good. It gives you a good arm workout. So we're just sweating down the potato. We're using a, a little bit of potato, not too much. Um, and you could also leave a potato out in a soup like this if you're trying to minimize your carbohydrates or starch for whatever reason. Um, but it does give a much silkier mouthfeel into the soup if you've got a little bit of starch binding all of those uh, ingredients together. Can I ask, I mm. noticed the uh, size of the potato was very small. The and little I, cubes. Little cubes. I'm not mm. sure many of us uh, take the time to cut them up into little cubes, do we? No. We do like halves and quarters. Uh, yeah. Should we be aspiring to chop our potato a lot finer? Does it change the consistency uh, later on? Look, we're going to be blending this soup, so no. But if you're doing a really beautiful, um, uh, like sometimes I like to do a lentil vegetable soup, you know, and you kind of want that texture. And then I do make an effort, oh, that's the blending sound. Um, the, I, I do make the effort to chop everything in sort of uniform pieces. I just think it feels better in your mouth. You know, I think you've heard me use the word mouthfeel before, and I think we're understanding more and more actually how it contributes to how you enjoy the food that you eat, whether you're peeling the skin from a tomato for a salad or whatever it is. So, yes, but I mean, it's not, you know, I, I just think don't let it put you off cooking. To, to, you know, rather just cook and, and make it however it is. But this is, is definitely, we're going to blend it. So um, I don't think we, you know, we need to make sure that it's uh, too, uh, too small. Okay, we've got this spice we're going to add now as well. It's called the chipotle spice, um, which is like a South American barbecue-ish vibe thing. Um, and I'm smelling it now, the strong smells of cumin and chili uh, and those kind of spices. There'll also be some uh, c ground coriander, etc. Smells really nice. Have a have a smell of that. Oh. It's quite strong. It's, it's almost the smell that you get when you walk into a spice shop. That cumulative aroma that you get. Yeah, it's lovely. But again, you you don't have to use this kind of a spice. Um, I think cumin on its own actually would really go quite well. Um, obviously, the chili is going to give it a nice little bit of a kick. You could even use just herbs, like some dill or something else like that would also go um, quite nicely. You don't have to use any spice if you're not feeling in the mood for that. It would be interesting to see how the coconut cream actually works with this little bit of, of chili. So I think the important thing for us here is when you are um, sweating down your veg, if, if things start to catch a little bit on the bottom, you can always add a little bit of vegetable stock if you don't want to add more, um, more oil or more fat. And I, I really want to maintain a vibrant green color in the soup. So I'm trying not to um, caramelize the vegetables too much. I'm just sweating them down. Okay, so everything is, is looking great. Now, the, the broccoli is, is straight from frozen. So we're trying to use, I think Jenny was trying to use uh, or showcase how we can use frozen vegetables in cooking. Um, and actually, you know, for me, feeding two teenage boys and a little girl and a husband, uh, by the end of the week, invariably, everything, regardless of how much I've shopped, is finished. The boys have been raiding the fridge. They've been raiding the cupboards. We get to Friday, Saturday, and it's really not looking like... Uh, uh, such a good situation, but they will definitely not steal these from the freezer. <laughs> definitely not. So I actually, and I'm not just saying this for the sake of the show, I have bags of, of frozen vegetables. Um, I ha have the broccoli, peas, sweet corn, um, some carrots, and also like a, a stir fry mix. And I always say to them, because they're old enough also to cook, that's a fantastic meal for them. I always have cooked rice, which I've frozen in uh, packets for them in the, in the freezer. And all they have to do is they can immediately do a very nice vegetable uh, fried rice in, in, in minutes. So it's a really wonderful thing, I think, to have on standby. And you can always do something, you know. Um, I know that we tried this incredible uh, vegan egg replacer, which was a little bit nervous of, you know, because you kind of wonder how are they going to, what do they put in it? How are they going to do that? But it actually is brilliant. And I've been making these amazing vegetable frittatas and then putting them in wraps and all kind of, of things. So, yeah, just a little bit of thinking out the box. Okay, so I'm going to add our broccoli. And again, like I said, I really, we don't want to lose that, that color or the nutrition, actually. We want to make sure that we're keeping all of those um, vitamins and minerals locked in. And you know, when it comes to also this idea of eating raw food, um, guys, you know, of course, it's really important that we have a really good amount of pre and probiotics in our diet. So I think 
speaking to everybody, I'm sure you guys, especially if you are here, you're interested in um, healthy eating and a, a, a healthier lifestyle, certainly from a, um, a, new, a food point of view. So you probably know what pre and probiotics are. And it's very, very, I think we, we're beginning to understand now that, you know, these things are absolutely essential for good health. In fact, I don't know if you've heard the gut being called the second brain. Have you heard this terminology? And you know, it's, it's so interesting because if you think about it, even before we had any understanding of these things, you know, people will say your gut feeling. And I think this is really, really interesting because uh, it, it definitely, you know, your intuition sits here. It doesn't sit here. You really feel it here, you know? Um, so I, I think you, you don't really have to know much even about science or medicine to appreciate these kind of uh, sentiments. So fiber, you know, I, I read a statistic the other day that was really quite shocking. Something like 97% of people in the US don't even get up to a third of the fiber that they need in their diet. So we have these very westernized diseases like diverticulitis, which are really just from a poor fiber diet. So what's sad about that is it's completely and utterly preventable. So really important to pack the fiber in. And I think what I love about this idea of plant-based, I love the fact it's called the plant pouch of plant-based eating, because I find when I've worked um, as a nutritionist in clinic with people, there's this idea of a reductive thinking when you think of a diet or a program or a plan. You know, you have to take things away. We always think, I have to stop eating that. I have to stop doing that. But actually, rather frame it differently and say, actually, I'm going to include all of these incredible, delicious, beautiful things in my diet. And then it doesn't matter if, if you're having a little bit of wine or some processed food or whatever it is on the outside. It doesn't really matter because the core focus of your diet is full of really beautiful, nutritionally dense food. But I would definitely say my, my top tips for everybody here, just from a nutrition point of view, is have as much fiber, have even more fiber. You don't have to sit there eating all bran flakes. Um, there's two different types of fiber, there's soluble and insoluble. So you need to make sure that you're getting it from both. Okay, so I think we're sweating this down nicely. I just want to make sure, obviously, it's thawing beautifully into the onions. We're going to add um, some vegetable stock as well. I think this is three cups. Isn't this cute? I love this. Uh, it looks like something out of a giant's house, you know, like a, it's like their little milk pouring jug. It's so pretty. Let's turn that up. And at this stage, has anybody got any questions? Yeah. Just raise your hand and I'll come to you with a microphone and you can... Uh, feel free to ask. Pick my brains if there's anything you want to ask about food or even nutrition. I'll do my best to answer. But I think also, guys, what's interesting about the, um, you know, this whole journey that I've had with helping people with their diets and with nutrition, I realize more and more um, that it's not most of us actually have access to a pretty decent knowledge these days, you know, um, reading about what we know good health means. But I think it's often the application of it that's challenging for people. They know that they want to eat better. They know that they want to eat more of these foods, but it's, well, how do I do that? Um, and actually, I have to say, nine times out of 10, that is the work I end up doing with families and people. It's not telling them what they should be doing, because generally, that is something that they, they know. It's, it's more to do with, how can I apply this to my day-to-day -day life. And I think one of my key um, like tips or things that I always do with everybody, regardless, is to plan. A little bit of planning really goes a long way. There's no way on a Monday night after running around after three kids and also trying to work myself, school lifting and everything, if I hit my kitchen at six and I go, oh, what are we having for supper? I mean, there's just my, I'm half brain dead by that point of that. I feel slightly traumatized by the gauntlet of Monday, you know? So I think a bit of planning goes a long way. So I love to shop at markets. I make that a priority for myself wherever I can. Um, I'll do that on a Saturday or on a Sunday. And then I'll just put all my ingredients out on the table and I'll just have a look at what I've got on the shelves. I have everything displayed in my kitchen in, in jars or my dry goods. And then I just have a look and see, well, what would go with what? What do we feel like eating? I try and have a formula where there's always sort of a main meal of some kind that will have some combination of protein, plant-based protein, and then some some sort of a starch, whether it's quinoa or brown rice or couscous or whatever it is, um, or even barley or buckwheat, and then there'll be some a raw dish, so a slaw or some sort of a salad, and then another vegetable dish. And I mean, it's I just 
function with the plate looking, you know, with those four quarters, and then I'll write everything down. I mean, it doesn't matter if you, if you want to change it slightly throughout the week, that's not a problem. But then at least you have a bit of a, a, a formula, and then you don't have to think about what it is, you know. And you're so right. That's, I think, one of the main reasons that people don't eat uh, good food is because they do get to the end of the day and they've forgotten to pre-plan and then it's a rush around and by yeah. the easiest instant. And I think that's also where frozen vegetables are so useful because as you said, on a Saturday or Sunday, uh, it's nice to dig into the deep freeze and of course McCain producing some great quality mm. uh, frozen vegetables. Yeah, I mean, they, they certainly look really good. I've been quite surprised, I have to say, um, with, and I, again, this is not a punt, um, I'm here today by surprise, so I'm genuinely speaking from the heart. I've been really surprised as to the quality of frozen vegetables these days, really. And I mean, the peas and the, the sweet corn, often I give them to my, uh, my two and a half year old just as a snack, which is 28 months. I literally just put them in warm water um, so that they're not icy anymore. And I mean, they're so delicious and sweet, and she literally loves to eat them as a as a little snack in between meals. So again, I think a another little tip, really, what I'm thinking about right now is that change the way that you think uh, the, the convention of food. You know, I, I did a recent trip to uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Malaysia, um, with my family in December. We went for three weeks. It was absolutely incredible. I don't think I've ever had food like that in my entire life. Uh, the people that understand flavor and everything is whipped up in five minutes, six minutes, everything is fresh. Lime leaves, lemongrass, a little bit of chili, a bit of onion. Um, they really know how to do that so well. And even for me, and I'm, I'm always reading about food and looking at it, I was so inspired. I came back full of like get-go to sort of get back in the kitchen and maybe be a bit more brave with some ingredients, but also eat foods, you know, they, they eat curry for breakfast. I'm not necessarily suggesting that that's a thing, but I think this idea that we have to have these very westernized foods in the morning is just, it's absolute rubbish. You can eat whatever you want. You don't have to eat eggs or cereal or, you know, whatever, any of these kind of things. You, you can eat whatever you want, whatever feels good, whatever your body enjoys. And, and another tip as well, you know, I think um, what I do with clients, for example, when we're looking at their diet and how we can change things for the better, I get them to keep a food diary for a week because I don't believe in making any suggestions to anybody that aren't already based on what they do. You know, if you don't eat a particular food or you dislike it, I'm not going to ask you to eat it. That really wouldn't make sense. You're not going to stick to it and you're certainly not going to make that as a, a permanent change. So that's the first tip, you know, to keep a food diary and also keep a, a mood and a food diary. See how you feel. You know, sometimes I make something for breakfast and I, I do get hungry quite quickly. But if I have a breakfast and it sustains me for a good three hours, I go, that was a good combination. I'm going to have that again. You know, make a mental note of what it was that you, that you ate. What made you feel good? Did it give you energy? Did it make you sleepy? Um, I think we often think that the power to sort of heal ourselves and also uh, be in great shape is outside of ourselves. You know, we have to get that help from somewhere. But actually, I think really, you know, intuitively, you can also tap into what you think works for you. So we're going to add the coconut cream. You can see it's a bit solidified. It's going to melt very quickly. Um, and another thing I learned when, when I was in Malaysia, which to be honest, I did not know was, um, and I watched them doing it wherever I went cooking. When you use coconut cream or coconut milk, you should really only add it towards the end of your cooking time. Because if you cook it to death, you lose a lot of that coconut flavor. Um, I don't know if any of you knew that. I, I didn't actually know that. Often when I've done a curry, I've really reduce the coconut milk into the, the sauce quite heavily. And actually, I realized you lose a lot of that fresh, creamy coconut flavor. So that was another thing that I learned that I'm incredibly grateful for. Um, but so many beautiful flavors. I don't know, have any of you guys been to the Far East? That far? Yeah? Have you been? Yeah, you've, you've been that side. Yeah, the food is incredible, really. Um, and I think uh, the fresh fruit as well, you know, because they're picking it uh, from the trees when it's much, much riper. A lot of palm oil, though, was quite... The, 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 the fields and... F I mean, like, you can't imagine. It's quite, a, it's quite a, a big thing. I don't know how, you know, we all feel about palm oil, but uh, I think uh, it's one of those very controversial uh, subjects at the, at the moment. Okay, so I think we're going to be almost ready to blend the soup. Yes, but now, of course, this is a bit tricky, guys, because... Yeah, no, no, I know how to take it. I've got this one at home. 
Um, these are great, the, uh, just be careful. The only it's thing is, difficult. we've got to be able to take this out because it's still quite hot. I'm wondering whether we should leave it a little bit and start on the curry before we blend. I'm just a little bit worried it's all going to go shooting up into the sky. Has anybody done that before? Yes, yeah, I've done that before too. Sure, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to check on the time that we will do our broccoli soup. Because uh, we don't want to overcook and, oh, and, yes, and absolutely. hurt the nutrition. Well, so you'll, you'll see. And a good way to tell, if you still look at these florets, they're still bright green. Okay. Yeah. Right. So uh, I'll be able to give, uh, I think other, the recipe's being published. Are they on the, and I do this, believe they are. This is being filmed and yep. the YouTube video will be loaded onto the website. Yeah, Jenny hasn't afterwards. put a specific time in so. here, but I can, I can tell just from looking at this broccoli, I don't really want to cook it any more, any more than that. Um, I'm more concerned about the heat in there um, um you know we can we can give it a two we can do a few ladlefuls and then do that because if i put the whole lot in there it's definitely going to shoot up into the sky well let's see let's do an experiment guys <laughs> i'll stand over this side and, <laughs> yeah uh, <good laughs> stand luck far with that. away so the benefit of obviously if you were asking about the size of the um uh potato, oh, potato. Yep. yeah yeah uh, it's obviously they've done it small for today so it cooks quicker if, uh, because we're doing this demo. Let's see. And that applies at home as well. If you wanted to cook quicker, sure. take the time to chop it into smaller pieces. And a larger surface uh, area of pot. Obviously, okay. if you're using a tiny pot like this or this, it's going to take, it's going to take longer. So it's all physics, guys. Is it physics? Is it physics or is physics. it? Yeah, it's physics, yes, not chemistry. Physics. Good Lord. We can all tell what I was good at at school. Yeah. <laughs> uh, incidentally, I... Um, when I was a, a, a small, uh, well, a young little girl, I entered all of these food and cooking competitions. But coming from a Middle East and an immigrant family, you know, there was absolutely no way we were going to go into cooking. I mean, I, I don't even think I thought about it as an option because you had to go and do something very, very academic. You know, there was just no way. So it was never an option, but I entered all these cooking and baking competitions. And at the time, you know, reality shows and things were just starting to, to be a thing. And I actually did, I was going through all my stuff the other day and I found this uh, uh, file full of certificates and things. And there was one from one of these like kiddie, uh, kiddie shows um, and actually I did go on to compete in MasterChef in the UK in 2010 do you know I've never actually watched it they video it I got through to the quarterfinals but I could not bring myself to actually watch myself on TV at the end um, but it was quite it was quite an experience I have to say and I had my second child was only I think Joseph was only like 10 months old so I had to leave him to go to London to do this show and you know they, they want to make good TV so they're constantly trying to get you to be emotional or do something because they want they want good TV and I'm really trying to keep myself contained but it's the first time I'm away from my two kids you know so they're constantly probing at you with the microphone until you end up doing something like crying or some kind having of an emotion. A, having thing. a good drizz. So what are we going to do? Are we going to give this a you, go? So what would, would, you, would your 10 month be proud of you now? <laughs> ask you questions like that, did they? Yeah. Are you no, are we, are you miss, should we call your husband? Is he with your son? I'm like, no, it's half past six. It's a terrible time to call. <laughs> Leave it off and let me call. Okay, I'm, I'm just, what should we do? Should we try? Should we just yeah, do a little you, bit of a pulse? You go ahead. Um, I don't, I don't, I want to be able to release. We're all safe oh. over here. That's the beauty of this blender, guys. You can just pulse it. There we go. Oh, that looks delicious already. I have one of these at home as well. It really was such a brilliant investment. Look at that. It smells delicious. Oh, you know what we didn't add? We didn't add any salt, did we? Mmm, no. No, we didn't add any salt. I think there is a bit of salt in the chipotle spice. These mixes do tend to have salt in them, so it's always a good idea to check, actually. I'm going to have a try first. <gasps> uh, the, there we go. It's fine. No, no, no. I just, uh, just want to make sure it doesn't go flying off. Yeah. Mm, there is actually a bit of salt in there. And there is salt in the stock um, that I was given, so just going to make sure. I don't think that needs any salt here. Try that. That is absolutely. Oh, I'm going to give you one of these maracas because I've just licked this one now. I don't think you want to share. No. No, well, no, no. I don't mind sharing. Yeah, but just try. That's delicious. And actually, what's nice is the coconut flavor is not coming through 
too strong. What can we do to let everybody try a bit? That's so yummy. Yeah. Mm, what can we do? Can we do we have spoons? Can we do some? Are we going to do? Oh, do we? Are we going to serve some afterwards? Oh, all right. That's really nice. And actually, the heat of the um, the chipotle, just that little bit of heat. That's really, really good. Should I blend the rest? Should I blend the rest and put it in a thing? Should we do it? Okay, I'll do it in sections then that way. Um, but that is really, really, really delicious. And I would, um, you know, soup is great as a starter, but, you know, it can also be part of a, a main meal if you serve it with some beautiful bread um, and a very nice side salad. Um, it's a really lovely and so, so nice for winter. I must say, I, I love soups. I, I also love gazpacho, which I don't, if, I don't know if all of you know what gazpacho is, but it's a Spanish um, cold summer soup. It's basically a salad soup, really, is what it is. Doesn't sound so great, but it's absolutely delicious. Uh, you know, fresh, really ripe tomatoes with some red pepper, some onions, sherry vinegar, um, salt and garlic and blended smoothly and in uh, Spain they add quite a lot of olive oil. You think it would be um, you know quite low in calories but it's actually quite calorie dense when you have it out because there's often a good a good third of it sometimes is very high quality uh, olive oil. I was quite horrified to realize that on holiday after I was guzzling my third carton uh, of the day that perhaps <laughs> I might roll home after eating gazpacho. Yeah. Go figure. Okay, let's do one more little squiz. And then I think if they can bring out the ingredients for the... Um, I, d I, d I don't think so. I have one of these at home. Thanks, yeah. So we'll bring out the ingredients now for the curry. Just want to make sure it's nice and smooth. It is such a perfect winter warmer. Mm. Soup that, and I could really eat nice. that for breakfast. It's can we can delicious. we serve it now to everybody? Are there spoons? Can we have everybody try a bit? Are you okay to sort of try it in couples and things? Yeah, yeah. Here, let's do that. We might need some spoons, otherwise everyone's going to have to. Uh, are they bringing the spoons yeah. too? Yeah. Let's do that first, because I'm sure you're all a little bit hungry. We are at lunchtime now. Yep. And then I think we have to get on and do this curry. Let's look. Okay, right. Well, we need the ingredients for the, the curry. Yeah. Okay. I'll let them bring out the spoons, and someone else can actually dish the rest of this soup. You really want to try this. It's really, really delicious. I'll put it in here, then it's easy. Okay. So the, the, the vegetable curry that uh, Jenny was going to cook that's... I've got the recipe for here, is a red kidney bean, cauliflower and corn curry. I've never used this uh, combination actually in a curry before, but it sounds delicious, really. Um, I, um, actually, I was super inspired to try it at home tonight, and I've got all of these ingredients at home. And I think that's what's quite nice about both of these dishes. You know, if you've got the, um, the broccoli in your freezer, it's pretty reasonable that you would have all these other ingredients as well, from the stock to the, to the coconut cream. I always, when I buy coconut cream or coconut milk, buy in bulk. Um, and I have a, a cupboard in the bathroom. I know that's strange uh, downstairs because it's the only space I have left in my kitchen. Why don't we pop it over here? And uh, often people, when they come and they're looking for toilet roll, you know, when there's, the toilet roll has run out and they're fishing around in the cupboards, they always come in looking very confused. Like, why is there like all of these goodies? Okay, so we're going to get going pretty quickly. I think we're running a little bit behind time. Um, unfortunately, we can only go as fast as we can go. Should we pass those around? Do you want to perhaps pour some of these in here and then maybe people can have a try. We can see maybe, maybe people who are friends or couples can share spoons. Okay. I think I'm going to get going on this side as I know this is nice strong flame. We've got a question very quickly. Go ahead. I'd like to know which local markets you shop at. Oh, it's you. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I love the, the Arrhenius X City Farm Market. I live in the City Bowl, so that makes the most uh, sense for me. Uh, and I do that on a Saturday. 
And if I can't make it, I'll often get them to put a box uh, together for me. Um, and if I'm out in the winelands, there's some other markets as well. I do also love um, the fact that uh, you can get boxes also these days from Babylon Sturen. And you might think, because Babylon Sturen is quite fancy pants, that it's expensive, but it really isn't. Um, the vegetables, are, most of them are organic and uh, very, very good quality. And their bread and everything is just the same price as what you would get. I'm talking about artisanal bread, though, sourdough and whatever, not obviously uh, bread from the, the supermarket. So those are my two sort of go-tos on a regular basis. But I also do get boxes from Abilimi. Um, I'm always looking for... Um, easier ways to, like if I've been away for a weekend, I'll arrange for a delivery. But otherwise, I do really like to go to the market. I go super, super early in the morning um, when it, you know the crowds are not there, especially with a two and a half year old. I like to get there early. And uh, it's really nice to sort of see all the, um, the vegetables there. And you know they're always displayed so beautifully. It's like, for me, it's a real celebration of uh, the, the real incredible bounty we have when it comes to uh, fruits and vegetables. I feel really good about uh, my shopping experience there, you know, and take everything home in a box, um, and obviously then no paper bags. I, th I think, you know, in, in line, and what's lovely to see with the whole plant-based movement, which of course, I mean, it has to be aligned also with being eco-conscious, is the idea that it's not just enough uh, for us to, to change the way we eat, but we, we have to make sure that we have less of a, a footprint. I'd really love to see more of the plant-based food companies taking this a little bit more seriously, really thinking about their packaging, etc. Because I think you're going to all that effort to make something that has less of a carbon footprint, and then you put it in a plastic packet that takes, you know, you've eaten the product in 15 seconds, 30 seconds, and now that plastic packet's going to be there. So, and I do think as, as um, consumers, I always say to my boys, your only voting rights is with your wallet, really. Wherever you put your, your money, that's where, you know, that, that's really what your voting rights are. How we spend our money is going to dictate um, the supply and demand of products and goods. What do you think of the soup? It's delicious, isn't it? Yeah and very, very simple. Okay, so for our curry, we've got pretty much, I can see we've got all the usual suspects of spices, your turmeric, cumin, cardamom, cinnamon, and, and chili powder. Um, there's also a bit of garam masala added, which is actually just a combination of those cooler spices, the, the corianders and the, the cumins and so on. Um, I really like to, at the beginning of uh, the month or when I've run out, I will actually do a whole uh, little uh, a, a spice blend for myself. I always like to use the, the whole seeds. I know that sounds a little bit fancy, but the difference, guys, from using fresh whole spices, toasting them a bit, grinding them, keeping them in a jar just for you to use for the month, I'm telling you, once you do that, you will never want to go back to buying the, the ready-made ground spices. I mean, unless you're using them all quite vociferously, they really are going to lose their potency and their flavor quite quick. So best to keep them whole and then really just put a blend together at the beginning of the month. Um, I sprinkle it on my avo, on toast, all kinds of things like that. Again, back to that idea of really challenging the way we use ingredients and food and not being sort of so fixed on the convention of in the West of how we, we think we have to use it. Okay, so We've got all these, isn't that cute? They've laid all of these wonderful spices and things out. You, yeah, can you open them for me and pass them my way? So, uh, yes, please, yeah. So with things like the whole spices, you definitely want to make sure you put them in first so that that way they toast a little bit. I love the smell of, uh, of cumin. And I was reading a little bit about the... Um, the spice trade the other day, because uh, many moons ago I visited Zanzibar, and I remember uh, reading this really, really um, interesting fact, which was it was the second place in the world to get electricity. Zanzibar, yeah, uh, because it was so wealthy. I'm correct, yeah. It was they were, it was such a wealthy nate because of the spices. You know, you can just imagine all those pudgy sort of Brits, pasty-faced Brits visiting these exotic parts of the world having existed on cabbage and, well, actually not even potatoes because they got those from South America. I don't even know what they were eating. So cabbage, there we go, cabbage soup. Uh, visiting these places and finding all of these um, incredible um, flavors and tastes. So we're adding some garlic and some uh, freshly minced ginger. I have to say, I'm loving this way of cooking. We're going to have to get the boys to do this at home, Johannes. So Johannes is my my sort of surrogate son and PA. He's much more helpful than my own two children, but my own two children are at school, so that's okay. We'll forgive them on this occasion. So we've got turmeric. You can see this beautiful 
uh, orange color. And actually, you can buy fresh turmeric, I think, from quite a few of the, um, of the supermarkets these days. We've got some chili flakes. I think I'm just going to add half of these, just in case there's people who are not too crazy about chili. And we've got coriander and cumin. These are our cooling spices. And, and this is a mix. I think this is the garam masala, but it's not ground. Let's have a look. Um, yeah, okay. We, but we don't have curry leaves. Oh, yes, we do. Yeah, I'm going to add these two as well. Here we go. Um, have, it, have all of you used curry leaves before to cook with them? Yeah, I'm actually just going to use a few and then I'll pass them around. Just have a, have a smell. Hannes, can you pass this uh, around to everybody? If, you don't have to stick your nose in, but if you want to have a smell, if, if, if you haven't used them before, I mean, the reason they're called curry leaves is because they literally, the whole leaf actually smells of curry. They're so beautiful. I often put them in when I'm steaming basmati rice with like a star anise and a stick of cinnamon. Really, really, really delicious. Okay, so here we go. I have beautiful aromas coming out here. Let's put all of these to one side. And okay, I'm not going to add all of this chili powder. That is quite a lot. I think Jenny was going to blow everybody's top off today, but I think with winter it's nice. Um, and actually, there is a, a, a sort of a theory that uh, um, using uh, chili uh, or eating chili helps with your metabolism. I've been told this by a couple of uh, Indian grandmas. I'm not sure I buy it completely, but I'm willing to go with it. I certainly think you eat a bit less. You know, if food is quite hot, you take your time, you, you, um, you, know, you chew, you go a bit slow, okay? And then we're going to add some tomato paste. And it's actually so easy, guys. And imagine if you'd now put this, your, your, your spice combo together, it would also make it a lot simpler. And you'd probably be a lot more inclined to use it. You don't need to go and buy really fancy pants, spice mixes from people that cost an arm and a leg. Really not necessary. Cool. Okay, so here we've got frozen cauliflower. I didn't actually even know you could get frozen cauliflower. Um, and I think actually in this sort of a case, it would work really, really well. You could also make another a cauliflower soup. Um, there's a beautiful cauliflower, uh, ginger and turmeric soup um, that I've made before. I think that would also work quite well. And we've got some peas as well. I'm gonna add those right at the end. Are these also from frozen? Because I think they do, they do, um, I noticed that in the, the freezer thing the other day, but I wonder if they're, they're canned or if they are from, from frozen. I'll find out for you guys just now. And of course, we all know how brilliant pulses are. Um, I have to say, coming from a Middle Eastern background and when we first moved to South Africa, I was quite surprised not to see more beans and pulses actually as part of local cooking repertoire. Because if you think about it, you can, you can uh, store them for long periods of time, they don't go off, and they're packed full of protein and they're very economical. So it really, I couldn't figure out why this wasn't part of, um, and often when I've done cooking classes and demos with people, a lot of them really, they all say, like, I, I don't know how to really cook a lentil or, um, or uh, uh, you know, different pulses. I think the important thing, if you're buying them dry, of course, they're from a can, okay. The important thing is to soak. Really, really, really important to, um, yeah, it smells great, yeah. Okay, lovely. So tasters will be served. Okay, we don't have to hurry is what you're saying. Okay, I was like moving really, really quickly. So um, the fairies in the back have already made a pot for you. So you'll be able to, uh, to try some. You're not, you're not waiting on me, so don't worry. So you can see, I don't know if you can all see from the video up there, all of these beautiful colors. Uh, guys, really is smelling amazing. And again, I mean, how quickly did we really whip this up? I think there's this idea that you have to cook and reduce a curry sauce with tomatoes to death. You really don't. There are many different types of, of curry, um, depending on which part of India or Pakistan you're from. I'm going to add a bit of stock, but I don't want to add too much. You will be able to taste the soup and the curry afterwards. Um, there we go. I also want to take a photograph so of that delicious. curry. Oh. Yeah. So in Persian food, um, so I do have a food blog, it's called Alia's Vibrant Life, and um, 
I, I focused on the food of my heritage, which is which is Persian food. What's really interesting about Persian food is uh, we don't use a lot of garlic in, in many of the dishes. And also, we use mostly the cooling uh, spices, so your cinnamons, your cardamoms. So it's, it's actually, a, a, when I've done my cooking classes um, and dining events, South African people really love it. I think there's also, because of the, the whole Cape Malay spice uh, compliment as well, it's something that feels quite familiar. And I, and I have to say, using um, cinnamon in savory dishes instead of just sweet. That's another thing um, to sort of just wrap your head around, but it can work so beautifully. Um, and nutmeg as well. Let's add that in at the end. And actually, I think something like this, if you wanted to give it a little bit more um, body, you could also add um, a little bit of coconut cream. Whenever I open a can of coconut cream, and I'm not using the whole can, Obviously, make sure you pour hot water over the can to melt the, the coconut cream in it. Give it a good shake. And then if I'm only using half the can, I pour the rest into ice cube trays and put that in my freezer. And then you can put that into smoothies. You can add it into your porridge or you can then add it into your savory dishes. So that's also a really nice, neat trick. Um, again, freezing things. Thank goodness for our um, kitchen appliances. No thanks to Escom, of course. I was just going to say. Okay. And then we've got the peas. I'm just going to add these. Really, if I was making this at home and serving it, and I wanted to make the curry earlier, I would make the curry, and then I would wait, and I would only put this on when I was warming the food. Because if you look at that beautiful color, that you want to keep that. You don't want dark, sort of very sad, uh, green-looking balls. I, so I would definitely only add this at the end. I, I've got a question around curry, and I love cooking curries myself, generally they're always with uh, some form of meat. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know, that's why they invited me here, because I'm ignorant and I'm learning. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I, I, I'm not sure if it's because of the protein that's in it, or whether it's just because, and this is my question. Sure. Uh, I've been told the best curries are the ones that you've let cool right down, and then you reheat it, and then the flavors meld. With a vegetable curry, does that rule apply or could we, you know, enjoy this instantly afterwards? I think, no, no, I mean, you could enjoy it instantly, but anything where you've got all of these flavors, it's, it's not about letting it cool, it's just about letting it sit in its, um, in its juices and flavors. So that would apply absolutely to vegetables too. I think it depends, you know, Thai curries are different. They're designed to be made very quickly, fast, and to be eaten immediately. So I think it just depends on the type of curry that you're making. But something like this, I oh know, this will taste amazing the next day. Even cold on toast for breakfast. I mean, again, shaking up your idea of what breakfast means to us all. I mean, if it tastes good and you enjoy it, why shouldn't you eat it in the morning? Okay, guys, so I'm going to put my peas on the top. Looking so pretty. Looks very appeasing. Smelling so good. Appealing. Appeasing. That's a dad joke. I've got more. Bo boomer humor. <laughs> yeah, well, nothing I say these days is funny. I, I think I'm cool. Every now and then I see a meme and I send it to my boys on Instagram and they, they just do that emoji with the shaking head thing. And I'm like, I'm trying so hard, you know? You're lucky you don't get the eye roll emoji. So we've got some coriander here. I'm just also going to chop a little bit of fresh coriander and put that in. I think they've put it here also to dress the curry because it makes it look pretty. But I think actually some nice fresh coriander added in at the end. Um, people are so divided about uh, coriander. I have some, I, I'm sure you all know this idea that for some people it tastes like soap. Um, it's, and apparently they've actually pinned it down to it being actually a genetic thing. There are genuinely people who just Smell really, soap and everything. Yeah. I, I, I love it. I love fresh coriander. Quite nice if you smell soap all the time because everything smells clean around you. Yes, but you don't want to put it in your mouth. No, very I think, true. <laughs> I think that's the, uh, that's the idea. Right. So you've Any got a really beautiful, vibrant curry here. I mean, look at this. Absolutely delicious. I'm going to give it a quick try as well because I haven't added any salt yet, but I just want to make sure. I think that stock is quite heavily salted. Have all my little um, spoons gone walkies? Ah, okay. That was the one I used. Okay, it's got my germs on it. I'll pop some in here so I don't burn myself. Any questions at this stage, ladies and gentlemen? I've got a question here. So the, the oil that you started off with, yes. what was that? Coconut oil. Coconut oil. Yes. It, and this one is deodorized coconut oil. But I, I, you know, as I was saying at the beginning, um, if you don't want that strong coconut flavor coming through in all your cooking, then the deodorized one is the one to go for. But it has been through more of a process okay. 
than the virgin. Yeah. And and fresh onions um, going with it. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah. That's um, absolutely delicious. Red red onions preferably or no? I think in curries and things you are better off using the the brown onions. Um, red onions are slightly sweeter. They've got a slightly different sort of taste. I, f I prefer to use them more in raw dishes, um, although there are some cooked dishes I know that I will caramelize them and use them in. Otherwise, I think for cooking, your brown and your white onions really are our best. Mmm, so nice, guys. You're really going to enjoy this. And you know what's lovely? Often I will add a squeeze of lemon or lime mm, over a curry at the end. You know, we now have this understanding of acid balance, but the tomatoes, because they're still quite fresh in this, coming through really strong. It actually really doesn't even need salt. It's really delicious. Well, if there any aren't more questions? any other questions, then we can bring nice. out the soup the food? and the food. Yeah, Thank lovely. you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you for cooking with me. Mm. Oh, no. All right. Mm, you can, uh, he's reminding me. If you're interested to follow a little bit of my Persian food, um, I think it is on the, the program, but my um, Insta handle is Alia's Vibrant Life. Sounds a little bit cheesy, but I chose that because I really feel like that, for me, that's what food is about. It's about putting in as much vibrancy. Oh, that's quite hot. Let me just pop it there. Um, and, you know, again, it's this idea of abundance and inclusion rather than taking things out or anything kind of austere. It's much more about having food that is really um, beautiful looking and enticing. What's lovely about Persian food as well, if you don't know it as a cuisine, is we use a lot of herbs in our cooking. In fact, I know people often say to me like, why don't you just have a herb garden in the back of your house if you use so much herbs? I'm like, I would literally need a field. Literally, I would need a field every month because we use herbs as vegetables. And that's another thing you could try doing um, at home. We do have this amazing herb frittata called a sabzi kuku, which is literally five cups of coriander, parsley. I like to add a bit of dill too. Um, and you finely chop all that up, or you use your food processor. And then you, um, you could use that just egg or one of those other replacers, and you make the most beautiful herb frittata. You could also use a bit of chickpea flour, and make um, uh, like a, what is it called, a soccer? You know, the Italians call it a soccer, but I think often when you're having a vegan and, or uh, um, uh, egg uh, omelette, they use this combination. It's like a chickpea flour, sort of like a cake almost in a way, like a spongy, a spongy cake. Thanks, guys. Oh, is it not warm? Well, we can actually serve some of that. That's delicious. Oh, it is warm. Ah, oh, gosh, there's a lot of soup here. I hope you're hungry. Wow. I'm going to do it for you. Okay, no, I, d I think this one, let's put it over here. I'll move that one over here. I just need to be plugged in, yeah. It just needs to be plugged, uh, plugged in, but it's fine. This one's working. We, we don't have to have any dramas. No drama llama. Am I serving up everybody? Yeah? Would, does anybody not want soup? Okay, you're all right. Okay, well, I'll put some in some cups and we can pass them around. Where is the, um, I need the ladle, the ladle. This is really, really nice. With some brown rice and coconut yogurt. Something like that, something a little bit cooling and some sambals as well, you know, some, something pickled. I'm obsessed with adding Pickle things, thank you. I think we just need a soup ladle, so I can start dishing up the soup. Maybe whoever wants soup can come up and grab it. Yes, or is that gonna be like, okay. Maybe that's easier. So do you think you'd cook these dishes at home? Yeah. It's always nice to have a bit of a reminder about things we forgot, because you've probably all had broccoli soup, and probably all made a curry like this, but then you sort of forget. You think, oh yeah, I forgot I can do that, you know? Yeah.